Good fucking morning, boys. Good fucking morning. How's life treating you on this beautiful Thursday? Thursday morning it is. Good. Average. Not very. Not very. Presumably. Nice. We're back in black. For another um, episode, my friends, and I haven't slept much. I'm going to admit it. I haven't slept much, uh, but that's the price we pay sometimes, right? That is the price we pay for uh, having. Uh, I don't know really what. Oh, the dog probably. Oh yeah. Oh, and also, I have a I have a company, right? Okay, so there was this woman. Who rang fucking 11 in the morning, right? Rang 11 in the morning and she was from fucking phone company because I have a, a phone on my company. And she rang 11 in the morning and she wanted to come up and give me her card. Next level phone salesman. Like what the fuck? No, you cannot come. You cannot ring on my fucking door and come up and give me your fucking card. Then I couldn't fall asleep again. Nice value. Fucking value. But hey, at least we got coffee. Is that a thing they do in Spain? I don't know. No, it's the first for me. Instead of calling on your fucking phone, they go to your door and. Uh, Fucking tangle shit ass fucking cord. <laughs> Old schedule had longer streams. Not true. Old schedule had roughly exactly six hours. You barely get six. What the fuck are you talking about? Huh? Here. My last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven streams, yeah? Okay, yesterday I was late because I had something to do, but 6.9, 69, 8.3, 8.6, 7.2, 6.4, 5.8, so average 7 hours-ish, it was E3, yeah, was it E3, okay, uh, duration, okay, E3, I don't know when entry started, but six four five eight six five seven five six three six one six two six eight seven one six seven seven four seven two. All right, we have definitely more hours now than before. Okay, definitely minus two hour intro. Uh not true. Not true. Welcome, welcome back. One year on humans are weird. This is four sound pepegi. Pepegi. Four sound. Pepegi. That ain't an emote. It should be. Wait, it is an emote. What the hell? Wait, how does the Oh it's just Pepega without the ears. It's just a Pepega without the fucking ears. If you weren't here yesterday. <sighs> We finished Jump King. This is easy, okay? Tomorrow, first try when we're demolded, okay? Within 30 minutes, the snake is gone, alright? So, we're gonna try out some new shite to die. Twitch Rivals Mordhau. Wait, really? There's a Twitch Rivals Mordhau and I'm not invited? Are they fucking mentally insane, Sulul? When is this tournament? Valigus got in? Ke? He's the reason I don't get invited in the first place. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, what kind of system is it? <laughs> Nord Donut Streams, this new Seth video two minutes ago. Oh really? I wonder if he went live with the video right as I went live. Just because he knows that you guys are the bitches. Oh, Bloodlines Masquerade, the first one. Alright. 
actually a little bit interested considering the gameplay we saw yesterday of the second game looked like fucking ass water hey hey people Seth here today no other major powers in LA as well. There's the Camarilla, which uphold the status quo and enforce the masquerade religiously, and our- It's fucking live. I didn't know that was a thing even. That's a live? That's a live. That's a, that's a thing? Tonight, I'll be covering one of my favorite RPGs, a cult classic that brings you back no matter how many times you finished it. Do you love shopping at Hot Topic? Do you hate natural sunlight? Have you ever wanted to suck off a homeless? If you answer yes to any of those, then I know exactly the game for you. you Vampire did. the Masquerade Bloodlines, released in 2004 by Troika Games. Bloodlines takes place in modern day LA, but our story begins in the Old Testament. So, to understand the lore, I'll need you all to whip out your Bibles and flip to Genesis 4. Remember Cain and Abel? In the Bible, the two brothers made offerings to God. Abel offered the Lord some lamb chops. Cain gave him some Weetabix or some shit. Naturally, God liked Abel's offer a lot more. So Cain disabled his brother by murdering him with a fucking rock. God was very unhappy with Cain for killing his brother. Nah, God doesn't give a shit. Cain's crime was murdering his brother and then having the audacity to lie to God. In the Bible, God punishes Cain to wander the earth. In Vampire the Masquerade, God punishes Cain by giving him superpowers. Cain. For crimes against your creator and your fellow man, I sentence you to immortality. I'm also giving you super speed and super strength. You can also turn invisible. Uh, would you like to polymorph as well? Sometimes I like to turn into a burning bush and scare the shit out of Moses. Anyway, God turns Cain into the first vampire. The only downside? He can't walk in the light and he has to drink the blood of others to survive. God's true punishment is giving Cain the ability to sire children, but with immortality Mortality, the only thing left to fear is death itself. That fear becomes paranoia, jealousy, hatred, not for humans, but for your own kind. And that fear ends up consuming you. Just as Cain murdered his brother, he is now forced to watch for all eternity as generations of his own children murder each other. Where do you come into all of this? You're a random schmuck who gets embraced against your will in a seedy LA hotel. When you wake up, you're a vampire. But before you get comfortable, the Camarilla boys break in, stake for both of you, and ship you off to vampire court. Turns out, siring vampires without permission is a big no-no and a violation of a masquerade, which is basically a loose set of rules to keep mortals from finding out about the supernatural and from realizing that Vladimir Tepes was, in fact, a high-level Tsimisi who turned Romanians into dining chairs, because if humans ever found out, that's a guaranteed death sentence for every vampire on Earth. The judges make their verdict. Your sire gets decapitated by Magilla Gorilla, the African muscle man behind Sebastian LaCroix, Camarilla Prince of LA. And you're next on the chopping block. Oh well, at least you got laid. However, Nines Rodriguez, leader of the LA Anarchs, protests against your immediate execution. Suddenly struck with a flood of emotion and newfound empathy, LaCroix decides to spare you your life. Instead, he sends you off on a suicide mission to get killed somewhere else. Else. Clueless and alone, you're thrown into this game as an unwilling pawn in a world of darkness. What? Oh, man. And you're a goddamn Malkavian, too. Wow. You really are fucked. But as with any chess game, if you underestimate the pawn, you've already lost. Survive, understand, and identify the other pieces on your board. Once you do, you'll have to make a choice between being a player and being a pawn. And I should warn you, a pawn is always sacrificed to protect the king. Before you start, you have to pick your clan. There are seven to choose from. They're generally very interesting and offer unique approaches to the game. Bruja and Gangrels are hobos and furries, respectively. They're very hot-tempered and have poor impulse control. Tremere can do this. Stop. 
They're basically undead blood mages. Toreador are the very definition of vampire sluts. Being a room temperature piece of ass does have its advantages though, and lets you get what you want without conflict. Ventru are like vampire aristocracy. Basically, they're assholes who think they're too good for sucking off a homeless. This is blood. Don't say that to what their you face, mean, though, man? or you might find your neck snapped. Nosferatu are hideously deformed. Women ignore you or call the police when they see your face. Yeah, yeah, what a bit. Lord! Oh, sweet Jesus! Oh, oh, oh. Welcome to you, <laughs> Damn, man! Don't be sneaking up on a brother with your crackhead skin disease test tube baby looking ass! Damn, this shit my pants! I don't sell no soap, so what the hell you want? So, really, no different from being alive. Malkavians are <laughs> batshit insane. Their curse makes them unhinged, unstable, and even worse, completely lucid and prophetic. They can also spread this insanity to others. As a result, they've got some of the best interactions and dialogue options in the entire game. Which may or may not include talking to stop signs and being interrogated by your own television. And that the source of the detonation possibly came from you. Hey, heard anything? Kind of musky. It's no small secret that Clan Malkavian is my favorite. If it's your first time playing Bloodlines, I recommend playing any clan which isn't Malkavian or Nosferatu. Why? Because the Madness Network isn't random. It's foreshadowing. It's knowledge you know but shouldn't. And all these revelations will go over your head when you can't make sense of it. Also, getting spotted out in the open is an instant masquerade violation for Nosferatus, which can result in your immediate death. It's better for seasoned players who already know who and where everyone and everything is. Also, I hope you like sewers, because you're gonna be seeing a lot of sewers as a Nosferatu. Hope you pack snacks. But why would I play this old ass game a second time, Seth? I got a lot of stuff to do. I got a reading to catch up on. Because, you goddamn Zoomer, the game isn't very long. Length isn't the point of it. It's the choices you make. And there's a lot of different choices you can take depending on your character, which come back to help or haunt you in the future. It's a very well-contained and believable world that never breaks your suspension of disbelief. You might be turned off by the vampires, and to tell the truth, I was too. So was my mom, and now she's probably finished the game more times than me. Because this game isn't about vampires, the undead, or the supernatural. It's about humans, and regardless of whether they're mortal or damned flesh, they all act, think, and feel human. They've got real fears, hopes, and motivations which drive their character. Every single character character, no matter how central or insignificant they are to the plot, are written fantastically well. And that's the main praise you hear for this game. The story and the dialogue, which has some goddamn amazing voice acting. I am the proprietor and salesman of the month several years in a row. The ladies call me, oh god, but you can call me Fat Larry with a F-A-T, cause I know I got a weight problem, I just don't give a fuck. I see your face is not so lifeless. Your nerves not so deadened that you cannot express shock. Tell me, child, is my appearance that frightening? Or is it my knowledge of you that is so unnerving? Hey! Welcome to Sang's Herbal Remedies. I am Sang. How may I assist you? Selling remedies is honest work. I came to America after discharge from Chinese um, uh, Herbal Remedies forces to help aging parents with store. Definitely, I am now American citizen. God bless the allegiance flag! Chinese invented gunpowder. Yes, I know guns. Hold on, please. These are good remedies for many problems. No credit cards. Kids. Kids don't know nothing. No more Yankee, my wanky. The finger need food! Through most of the game, you're given tasks to complete by LaCroix. These serve as the main quest line, <laughs> and you'll need to finish them to progress the story and unlock Bam. new locations. You'll get to meet the other major powers in LA as well. <laughs> There's the Camarilla, which uphold the status quo and enforce the masquerade religiously. Anarchs, who respect the masquerade but hate the politics and hierarchy of a Camarilla. The Sabbat, who don't give a shit about the masquerade and seek dominion over mankind. And finally, there's the Kuei Jin, Asian 
vampires that have recently moved into Chinatown and filled it with gacha machines. They use the negative chi formed by gambling, organized crime, and gacha balls to fuel their aggressive business practices. Besides the main story, there's dozens of side missions to complete. None of these are your standard fetch quests either. They force you to think and decide for yourself how to best approach them. Completing missions is important, since that's your only way of getting the experience points necessary for upgrading your character. Most of them can be resolved peacefully by talking or stalking. Some of them, however, cannot. And whether it's from other vampires or the same dude in a wife beater, copy-pasted 200 times, violence is inevitable. So building your character to be a smooth-talking, anemic slug might not be the best idea. There's a lot of nightclubs in this game, by the way. They're a good place Seems to, to be a, a lot also of got different some pretty good music. You can also dance. Even outside, there's some very nice ambience to fit the mood. It makes you feel like you're actually there. This game taught me that Santa yeah. Monica is a shithole. So, don't feel bad about the people you kill no. there. In a way, you're saving them from the pain of living in Santa Monica. Bloodlines controls quite simply. You play it in first person while interacting with objects and NPCs, and you pan out to third person whenever you're in combat. Combat can be enjoyable, but mostly, it is not enjoyable. Combat boils down to mashing left click while desperately scrolling with your mouse wheel and smashing right click to reactivate blood buff. Oh yeah, every clan's got vampire superpowers or disciplines unique to their bloodline. Many of these cost a lot of blood to use, but they're visually impressive, they can end fights instantly, and they break the monotony of endless button mashing while hoping and praying that your enemy's life bar is smaller than your own. You could use guns instead, but unless you've invested skill points into firearms, you might be dead by the time you take a shot. Outside of combat, you'll be doing everything from investigating serial murders to evicting unfriendly spirits out of hotels. The Ocean House Hotel is there to remind you that just because you're a spooky bloodsucker doesn't mean you're not capable of terror. The Ocean House is so infamous that it's got its own console command to skip the entire sequence. It's probably one of the what? best horror segments I've ever seen in a game, and they managed to do it without a single jump scare. Just a feeling of pure condensed dread. Your inventory is conveniently infinite, so you never have to worry about space. You'll pick up useful Thank items God. like blood bags and firepower, and less useful items like birth control and estrogen pills. This game's difficult, and there's a few frustrating points in the story that might make you quit. Point number one, Hollywood sewers. At some point in the story, you have to find the Nosferatu, as they've gone into hiding for reasons unknown. This has nothing to do with a free billion Tsumisi flesh puppets clogging up every sewer drain. And you're gonna have to fight them all, including this big bitch who throws spare ribs at you. Also, there's no blood down in the sewers, so I hope you brought an entire fridge supply of blood with you. Good luck. Luckily, the unofficial patch fixes this completely. The good old games copy comes with a patch pre-installed, so you can take a convenient shortcut and save yourself the pain of going through this programmed hell. Point number Number two, Werewolf Park. In this universe, werewolves are incredibly rare, but they're also invincible killing machines. In fact, you can't fight this puppy at all. It's immune to damage and can stun lock you to death in several swipes. This all happens in a span of five seconds, so most players never even get the chance to understand what the fuck is going on before they meet their final death. Again, again, and again. Even though it kills you in five seconds, you're expected to survive for about five minutes. Oh, and for Forget about regenerating what happens your if health. Werewolf claws burn through your flesh, so it can't be healed back. However, after years of dying to that same werewolf, I found out you can actually kill it. What the hell? How is I supposed to know that you're actually meant to run into the observatory, flick the circuit breaker outside, run back in, open the dome, lure it into the dome, and crush it to death? How the hell was I supposed to know that? The answer is, I didn't. I had to look it up on the wiki. After years of suffering through the same mission each playthrough, this is... Oddly satisfying. However, if you can endure past those rough patches in the story, you'll start piecing together what's going on. The concern and focus of every major faction in LA is in one way or another centered on the arrival of a certain archaeological treasure, the Ankaran sarcophagus, which 
throughout the game has a bad habit of getting stolen. What's inside? Who knows? An old Assyrian king? Or a slumbering antediluvian? One of the oldest granddaddy vampires out there, who, if you traced your blood far back enough, might be one of your original fathers. Half a city believes the latter. They also believe that the moment father dearest wakes up from his slumber, he's gonna be hungry. Real hungry, and he'll sate that hunger by feasting on his children. Wherever we go, it is the blood of Cain which makes our fate. Your fate and the fate of the Ankaran sarcophagus are inescapably intertwined. Will you open up the sarcophagus or seal it away for all eternity? That choice is up to you. Vampire of the Masquerade Bloodlines, a very unique, flawed, and fantastic diamond of a game. Terrible combat, 0 out of 10. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. Zero out I'm of just ten. fucking with you. 10 out of 10. One of my favorite and one of the most replayable RPGs of all time. There's very few games out there that keep pulling you back over and over again and still manage to make each playthrough different. And this is one of them. Go buy it. Go play it. You won't regret it. Get sucked into the atmosphere. Get a craving addiction for it and replay it every few years for the rest of your natural life because there's nothing quite like it. A warm thanks to the many members of a merchant's guild generously funding and bankrolling these Kinda videos. Kinda spoiled You're it though, if we're gonna be wonderful. honest. You're going to get a visitor at your door next- He kinda spoiled it. <laughs> I mean, it's... I don't know. It feels like, it feels like uh, it's one of those games that will take probably a long ass time to beat on your first playthrough, right? Probably like 30 hours plus. 20 to 40. Yeah, he said it's short. It's not short in your first playthrough. He mentioned like uh, tons of things that would fuck you over. Like just picking the right race or whatever you, can probably fuck you over. Or the wrong one. I don't know, maybe I just wait for the second one. The second one looks little as fuck too, actually. But probably a m bit more thought out in terms of gameplay. Game publishers should hire this guy. He can literally make any game look fun. Stop with the fucking hmm. <laughs> PPGN. Okay. It's a good game, man. Yeah, I bet. It was a very good game for its time. The problem is that a lot of the time when you recommend shit, it's fucking nostalgia trips for you guys. And for me, it's my first playthrough in the current year. Fucking eight years after release date. And I'm sitting there, what the fuck am I playing? But maybe. Let's go ahead and... Welcome to Uganda. Welcome to Uganda.